We have a great program for you tonight. Thank you for joining us. We're going to be talking about Navident 3.0, full mouth rehabilitation, the new functional abutment selection and bone screw trace registration. We have a very talented panel here with a prosthodontist and a periodontist that work very closely together um, on some really uh, exciting cases that they'll be excited to share with you. We have um, our first speaker is Dr. Celine Cow, and she received her Doctor of Dental Surgery degree from Cao Sheng Medical University College of Dental Medicine in Taiwan, where she completed her education as a prosthodontist with the degree of Master of Dental Science. She continued one year training in advanced education of prosthodontics at NYU followed by an additional year of clinical fellowship also at NYU. She obtained the master's degree of dental science from Columbia University School of Dental Medicine in the prosthodontic division. She is the former clinical assistant professor in both NYU College of Dental Prosthodontics and Columbia University College of Dental Medicine, the prosthodontic division. Dr. Cal lectures nationally and internationally, focused on digital implant dentistry. She currently serves as clinical assistant professor at Taipei Medical University School of Prosthodontics. Our second speaker is Dr. Su Shan Chu, and she received her Doctor of Dental Surgery degree from National Taiwan University in Taipei and her Master of Science in Periodontics from Columbia University in New York. She's a diplomat of the American Board of Periodontology and a diplomat of American Academy of Dental Implantology in Taiwan. She has published several peer review and original articles in various dental journals. Dr. Chu is a clinical assistant professor in Taipei Medical University and currently she serves as a postdoctoral periodontal clinical instructor at the National Taiwan University. And she practices in multiple clinics in Taipei. She lectures both nationally and internationally on periodontics and implant dentistry. Doctors, the screen is all yours. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction. Thank you, Beth. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everyone. So um, it is actually our morning. There's 12 hours difference if it's for Eastern time, but good evening, guys. Today, uh, we're happy here to share with you guys our full digital workflow featuring util utilizing navigation, navigated machine for treating uh, complicated, complicated cases like on um, X full mouth rehab patients. So we're gonna quickly dive in. For your easier to understand, because um, we checked upon the list and we realized that there are some participants that are not so familiar with the digital workflow, even how to utilize the digital equipment like scanners or a navigation machine. So the outline that I designed for you guys for the in our lecture today is we're going to start with the basic foundation and we are going to gradually move to our feature, which is the latest version 3.0 of navigation machine Navident. So the basic, it always start with the question, the like core question, why should I go digital? Why can't I just practice as what we have been doing for the past 50 years? And how this navigation machine works? Is it precise? How am I going to utilize it? Is a benefit for my practice? And the third question is, once I start, once I decide, once I want to get started to utilize this type of machine, how am I going to apply this type of workflow to this such complicated cases that basically there's nothing is going wrong, right? Everything's going so wrong. We don't have proper landmarks to start with. I'm gonna walk you through our workflow and there is an algorithm that we created. And the, late, and the last part would be the features. 
So starting from why go digital? And this is the actually, as I said, that's the core question that I got frequently asked from the podium. Because the doctor always, you know, feel that they're not such a need to utilize digital since we've been practiced, as I've mentioned, the conventional for the past like 100 years, and we seem to get pretty good results. So is that just the, you know, like a lot of them, they will ask me, say, is that just like they buy you to say that? Is that the conspiracy from the company? Or is it truly be benefit? It's going to be truly beneficial for your practice. So answering that question, I always like to talk about science, you know, and logics. So let's start with what the actual problem, what the actual source spot of the conventional dentistry that we encounter daily basis and doesn't seem like a better your scientific or logic standard way to solve it. Just like Steve Jobs says, I love this, you know, this, this idea, any type of the technology any type of the digital technology that is invented to fulfill the unfulfilled need, right? So basically it's like fulfilling whatever that we can be, we can never overcome or what we always encounter the problem with, it's been designed. So starting with the conventional problem, this is my patient, patient always walk in and for the cases that's evolving more than only one tooth, it's like basically both arch full mouth rehab you will take some record and that's how you start with your case because you basically want to predict how are you going to restore the teeth in the future and maybe give shopping and couple implants or give them denture or anything like that. You have to collect the data. So the conventional data that we get the best is by professional camera. We all get training throughout the years that we take precise camera to capture the detail for us to analyze the case properly. And we basically, we will take a couple x-rays, either two-dimensional or the three-dimensional x-ray to being able to really start analyze how we're going to move forward, what's the treatment option we're going to provide the patient. However, there's always this major problem that I don't know about you, but I encounter in daily basis. That is frequently, we, let's say we take a model, we take photos, and we are going to do a diagnostic wax up. We are working heavily, intensely, intensively transferring the new correct parameters to establishing the proper right teeth on the cast. However, we're seeing, we're analyzing everything through our eyes. And we basically, we need to use 10 tons of imagination in our brain to quickly analyze how we are going to transfer the information on our physical cast that we are holding on. So basically we are utilizing a lot of vision. We are using a lot of imagination and not to talk about when it comes to the communication with your partners or with the patients. Frequently, the first, you know, for the, for the right top, you will see frequently the diagnostic wax up, which is going to dictate their future teeth position, the art, very off from the very end that you're gonna place your teeth over, right? Because we are talking to our technician, not using a very scientific evidence, like, you know, like um, like they're more precise three-dimensional photo or a more predictable vision for them to really understand what they're working on. And for the second one is also we're using our brand to synchronize the future teeth position along with the bone in our brand to place the implant as a second one, which is a freehand implant placement. Highly chances is like more than 90% of the chances you're not going to place implant predictably. So as I, you know, often joke around in university, we've been through me and both me and Dr. Chu, we've been through, you know, this intensive uh, specialist training in US. And the famous joke is, you know, you always want to, when you first get the cases, you get excited because you want to do a lot of implants or do, you know, a lot of different prosthodontic design. You want to practice. And you thought that you're going to get like a perfect smile just as, as, what you, as what you saw at the screen on the left. It's like perfect white teeth, patients going to smile to you every day. Everything's going to be great, like a dream. However, along the way throughout the time, you found that the treatment is sort of being composed like piece by piece and nothing's going right, right? You're like, 
exhausting and running around fixing things here and there and ended up the famous joke is you want to fix the teeth in a day but you ended up have the teeth in a decade that you would never be able to finish and that is just the perfect example of losing the control of cases and that frequently the problem has been generated because of the problem that I just addressed from the conventional problem. So in order to solve the problem of the doctors as well as the patients, we don't want to waste the patient's time and patient feel very uncomfortable with you, especially during the treatment. The technology has been developed. It was actually once being utilized and broadly actually being utilized in industry that nowadays we could to be able to utilize it, apply that in our medical practice, hoping to improve the quality of the treatment. And what does what actually defines a quality of treatment is supposed to compose with a couple pieces that actually brings up the quality and brings down and, and, and reduce down the problem, the headaches, as I said. So the quality you know, it's like very number specific terms. So if we look further into that, it's basically we want to improve the dental work in terms of its biology. It has to be bio biological friendly. You need to be able to clean around the, the teeth that you design, right? Otherwise it wouldn't last so, so long. And the second piece is you actually need to improve the function, the mastication of the patient because the major basically the major concern and the major need from the patient is they need to be able to chew. And the third part is nowadays, especially the social media has been really, you know, take the place everywhere. You need to not only give the patient back their ability of chewing, but as well as they need to look pretty, right? Otherwise they couldn't take photos on their Instagram or TikTok. So basically the biology, the function, the aesthetics that plays the major role in the future predictable teeth that you're supposed to serve, you're supposed to apply to your patient. And the last puzzle will be you want the teeth to last for more than a year. It's not just the teeth that you treat, you provide temporarily. You want this to be able to serve the patient for a longer period of time, just like anything you purchase. So durability is also the fourth part that I consider, you know, it's in genuinely very important. Things that you want to reduce <clears throat> is improving the quality in terms of improving quality is that you don't want to waste your time as well as the patient's time. If they came for like 20,000 times, they lose confidence in you. And you want to potentially reduce the cost of your, uh, reduce your cost of what you spend. If there could be a con more control way instead of being back and forth and back and forth, improving your efficiency in terms of treatment, as well as the most important part from a perspective. I don't want headaches throughout the treatment because sometimes it could bite you hard. Like when you, you know, there are times that when you're on your bed, you're keeping thinking about complicated or failing cases that you don't know how to solve it properly. We want to avoid that. So these are all what the technology in medicine, in dentistry, that's supposed to assist you. So let's take a look at the digital dentistry. So substituting what the two-dimensional image, we actually got this three-dimensional, you know, intraoral scan, that's what we said, that you can flip it around and you can actually see further in your both heart and soft tissue. And then you have the three-dimensional of the cone beam scan. What's substituting your eyes is actually the intraoral scanner you're not being biased, you're just capturing the data. And then you're able, you're being able to have the ability to design, to actually draw the design of future teeth on the very standard software. So everybody can see it, including your partners as well as patients. And then being executed through the machine that's being very controlled to tell you where to go. So you can design it and then you can place it properly and then manufacturing out according to your original plan. And that being said is having control of your cases and that's the value of digital dentistry. So moving on to how uh, the navigation works, which is our main topic today. I always love to introduce it as a Google map, you know, navigation machines, just like any type of navigator, it basically gives you two abilities. 
One is to direct you to your destination, right? You want to go somewhere else, you use your Google map and it leads you to the way. And the second part, which is amazing is it's not only giving you the destination, but also along the way that you're approaching to your destination, you get this instant and dynamic feedback, what's going on around you. So basically, if you encounter, you know, a, a reconstruction area, you need to go detour or you get traffic, you need to reroute it. This constant feedback actually instruct you, actually gives you information to avoid problem. And that is exactly what Navida navigation machine is, its function. So in this slide, you can, in this, sorry, in this movie, you can actually see there's a target there, but, but target is just secondary. If you look at in the middle screen, in the middle of the screen, this cross section view, you will see a plant yellowish uh, and plant position. And your green bar is where your future, you're, you're actually performing on, the implant is inserting in. So it gives you, as what I said, the ability to, follow your plan, it gives you the destination that telling you where to go properly, avoiding the surrounding um, anatomic landmarks that you don't want to, you don't want to touch upon, you, you don't want to hit it, you don't want to hit the nerve, you don't want to hit the vessels. And the second most important, I mean, the, the most important thing, but the second, you know, features that I want to share with you guys is you have to actually not only being navigated properly, but you actually need to enter then your destination precisely as well. And that being said is where you see in the middle screen, there is a red outline of the teeth. You know, you've got to have the teeth superimposed with your bone. So you know you're following the, you're following the teeth, inserting into the surrounding bone that your implant is going to be fine and it's going to be restored properly in the future. And that being said, is purely just prosthetic um, driven implant dentistry. We want it to not only being os integrated in the bone, but we also want it to be able to function and it has to be look good. So planning the teeth is crucial. And that is what actually the core structure of what we're getting started. We want to plan the teeth properly along with the bone and we plan it properly where the implant future is gonna be. And then we synchronize the patient's position along with this plan. So then you can execute it properly along what we're planning on. So, you know, as what we talked about, planning teeth, that's the most crucial puzzle along with this whole idea of navigation because it will navigate you properly. As I said, the machine, it's mostly correct, you know, as long as you're feeding it proper data. The machine, pretty much it's 99% correct, guiding you to your destination, but you will never want to enter in the wrong destination. Otherwise the machine, it's not, you know, otherwise the machine can only tell you this much. That being said is you don't want to enter in your Google map, your wrong destination and the machine correctly guides you to the wrong point. So just like this slides that I'm, I'm showing to you guys, if you, plan, if you plan your implant just along where the existing teeth are, instead of considering the future prosthetic plan that you're gonna change, because most of the full mouth rehab patient, the teeth are most likely it's gonna be gone. It's not gonna be at the right place. Otherwise, why are we extracting it, right? So you have to define where we are going to put the teeth back and then work backwards, you know, and then you can finally start to plan your implant position. So this is exactly where we want to get started. You want to have this three-dimensional teeth that virtually being designed, and then you could be able to find the proper location where you want to place the implant. Meanwhile, examine through the bone that whether it's enough or not. So this is the plan part, as we talked about the plan part for the navigation to start with, especially for a full mouth rehab, it's either failing dentition or fully dentalism. Not enough landmarks that is frequently encountered, sorry. Minimal uh, landmarks, that's, that's a problem we frequently encounter. And that is the reason why we want to you know, share with you guys, there are 
important information and data, as I mentioned, you have to feed the machine so that can guide you precisely to the precise plan that you, you want to have to implement it in the future. So you can see the teeth, it, you're not gonna follow the wrong teeth or failing dentition at this point. You will have this new set of the teeth in the future that you want to apply, just like your conventional diagnostic wax up and you superimpose with the bone, then you plan your implant according to your bone and your teeth. And according to, of course, your prosthetic design in the future. And with that, that brings up to our algorithm that we want to share with you guys. Starting from the left side, you will see acquiring the data as well as the virtual wax up. Then you will utilize this wax up, this future teeth plan to first on top of, uh, for the first top aisle, you will utilize this data to superimpose with your bone. Then you will see all this yellow planning and then executed it along with your plan utilizing navigation machine. And for the bottom aisle is for the same set of the design of the teeth, you're gonna utilize it for your provisional or your future definitive teeth, right? Because the plan, it has to go along with your, what you're doing, what you're applying to your patient in terms of teeth. So the same set of design is what you're gonna to utilize to prefabricate this provisional shell for you to utilize it on the day for your surgery, picking up to provide the patient an immediate low, immediate functional full arch provisional restoration. So let me quickly walk you through what our sequence is uh, for uh, full mouth rehab as what I said, in terms of that algorithm we created. I'm gonna break it down more in detail so you can get a better understanding. First, we acquire, as I said, the intraoral condition. And the intraoral condition is mostly wrong it's either failing dentition, just like the left side patient probably have a denture or just teeth moving here and there, or it either it's just at the right side of fully dentalism. You only have a dentalist ridge. Then you will have to utilize your fundamental knowledge as a doctor to redesign your teeth are going to be restored properly. So basically that's the fundamental knowledge from your complete denture textbook, right? You have to put back the teeth first. So that brings to the next step is the CAD, the digital design of the teeth. You have to, uh, we used to do a convention. We used to hold on the cast and do the wax up, you know, use the wax drip by drip to redesign, recreate a future nice teeth. But now we're utilizing the software to redesign it. It's either, you know, over teeth or a denture look thing. So then to carrying on the next step, we have this nice teeth right now, and we have patient's bone information right now. How are we going to apply this new design of the teeth on top of the bone so we know where to drill our teeth along with the tooth and figuring out whether we have bone or not. So basically we need to apply the teeth design and synchronize it with the current bone so we can start our planning of the implant position. And that is actually what I kept on saying. We need to feed adequate data to the machine so that it can afterwards navigate as well. And that is the puzzle that we, that, that is the puzzle and the most crucial part for this algorithm. It's fiducials. So basically the fiducials is the transferring marks that it, you're gonna utilize to provide the patient this design, which you just don't have much, right? You don't have much to begin with and overlapping on your bone. So basically you will see the teeth in the, in the, in the model or in the skin, and you will also see this teeth in under your combing CT. And that being said, is you use this fiducials to overlapping these two important information, both digital scan as well as the bone scan. And there are two different types of the fiducials. One is we basically applied it on top of the teeth. And the other one is we will have something fixated into the bone and that serves different purpose. So the Type one fiducial is 
we basically we will have our digital wax up and the digital wax up we will either print it out or mail it out into a prototype that we tried it in the patient's mouth so basically now we're trying we're delivering this digital prototype in the patient's mouth but meanwhile carrying this fiducious this transferring marks so that allows me to have this information putting back the prototype putting back to the patient's mouth with the fiducial. So you will see the denture with the fiducials that we marked on. And the patient will wear this fiducials, this prototype to take a coping skin. So that's where the yellow star is. You will see it over the denture as well as the CT image. And that's how you overlapping, you're, you superimposing the image together. And that gives you ability to know where the teeth positions are, and then you can insert and you can virtually plan your implant, the yellow implant position, along with the teeth, along with the surrounding bone. The second part is you want to utilize something fixed in your mouth. It's not only giving you the ability to overlapping the intraoral condition to your CT, as well as you will need to, as I said, you will need to transferring the information, telling the machine where you are. So this is the part that we need to synchronize patient's arch with the competency, with the plan. And that is what we call the um, bone pin. And Dr. Chu is gonna talk about this a little bit more, but um, basically, this gives you the ability to not only overlapping planning your case, but the most important part is you utilize this to verify, to uh, register your patient's position along with your plan throughout the surgery. And that is the fiducial markers. So basically, uh, if you're familiar with the navigation machine, these bone screws, it's not only giving us the ability to be able to synchronize the plan with your bone, but the most important part is we actually use it to trace. We actually use it to register our edentulous part with our uh, uh, edentulous uh, arch of patient with our plan. Then we can follow in carrying out our, um, our surgery. So um, this is how the presentation that we actually did intra early. So we will print out a prototype to prototype carry a couple of additional markers. And then we will probably redesign it slightly, just move the teeth here and there, give it a final touch. And that is, so the second part of the uh, design is we want to improve the position of the teeth for the preparation for provisional, for us to being able to uh, perform the full arch immediate load. But the same set of the design, as you can see, we synchronize it with the bone, then we can be able to have the implant plan everywhere along with the arch, along with what we're going to do in the future with our definitive prosthesis. And the last is you will export an SDL carrying on the implant information along with your teeth position. Then you will have this information synchronized back to your original plan. So you fabricate out a full arch shell. That's what we call the full arch provisional, but having this pre-drill corresponding holes along with your plant implant. And the material selection, basically you can have it heat process milled or you have to print it printed out. But latest current um, science is if you want to have more strength, maximum strength and durability, uh, milled full arch uh, provisional is highly recommended and the most recommended for now. So you will see it's been milled out. So prior to your implant surgery, these are all prepared and on the day of the surgery, we have the navigating machine, we have Nevident to place, to guide us to place implant properly, precisely along with what we have planned. And, and then we can just utilize this shell, you can see at the bottom, just insert in smooth, just, not, I wouldn't say just, you know, easy as piece of cake, but still it gets you the ability to being very close to where you're on. Your, your protocol is gonna be in the future, you just need to somewhat adjust the hole accordingly slightly, then you can be able to perform your full arch uh, provisional immediate pickup. 
And this is after the pickup, you have to make sure everywhere is smooth and round and the patient is good to go. So um, I'm gonna hand the time, the rest of the 30 minutes to Dr. Chu to talk about our feature for today, which is the latest version of the features that the Nevident is gonna provide us. She will talk about the geo trackers as well as how the latest version of the technology we can actually trace over the surface in order to achieve the synchronized steps as what I just described. So um, let's welcome Dr. Chu. Thank you, Dr. Ko, for your wonderful presentation. And um, good evening, folks. I will continue from uh, what Dr. Kuo have said and uh, start to introducing all the new features uh, that Nevident come up with and um, also how to be create creative while you're using all these materials and try to make it work even better uh, on your, in your clinical work. Starting from the uh, rationale of how Nevident actually works. Um, the machine, uh, they're equipped with two like um, detectors, which can detect uh, one jaw tracker and also the other one, it's the tracker mount on your handpiece or the instrument they are using. So they are recognizing uh, the one, the, the tracker that is, that's in your mouth, which is recognized as a, a, the non-movable one and to detect the one that's moving. So this is the, the basic uh, rationale behind how Nevident works on guiding your surgical procedures. So what's the new features that can actually help us out uh, while you're working on your case? The new Joe tr trackers, there are three different kinds of trackers. The first one is on your uh, left-hand side, which we call it Joe Tracker C. That's the one you use composite to attach on your teeth or anything that's non-movable in your mouth. The second one we call it uh, Joe Tracker B, which is secured by the bone screw directly. You screw it in uh, into your bone. So that's the one that's um, not movable in your mouth as well. The third one, we call it uh, Joe Tracker U. The Joe Tracker U is the one you have a U-shaped type of clip attachment and um, you use the uh, by registration material, which uh, you have to pick up the certain kind of uh, by registration material to make it stronger and um, non-movable. So this one, it's more like a snap-on uh, type of attachment. These are the three new type of jaw trackers that you can use while you're doing your surgery. And today we're talking about like the um, all kinds of uh, full mouth reconstruction cases. So when you're working on this type of cases, Joe Tracker U doesn't really work because for the patient who has very minimum teeth or they have very mobile teeth, that's the indication of uh, having full mouth reconstruction. So that's the reason why Joe Tracker U doesn't really work in this kind of uh, patients. So we will focus on Joe Tracker C and Joe Tracker B today. And um, to the, uh, in the very beginning, I say you have to be creative because um, when we're using Evident, we, we start using Evident in about like two years ago. And back at the time, there are not uh, like you don't have so many choices for you to um, secure your tracker on the teeth. So we have to be um, kind of creative while working on the teeth. The picture on your top left, that's the one um, like the, the very regular type of use. You secure your uh, jaw tracker C with composite on your teeth. Don't forget to put on some um, bondings before you, you uh, secure the jaw tracker C, otherwise it could come off during your surg surgical procedure. So that's the first one, um, the very regular type of one. I usually like to secure my jaw tracker C uh, using the undercut between um, interdental area. So that's the easy one. And then the one on the top right, there are two pictures. So for this two picture, it's actually um, the one we did uh, in about two years ago, or at least like a year or so. 
um, the patient has a few, like very few teeth remaining in the mouth. And um, some of the teeth are uh, mobile or it's very hard to secure the jaw tracker C on only one tooth because um, it could rotate. And um, the patient happened to have a implant um, on his uh, bottom jaw and um, the implant is still stable. So we took off the, uh, the crown on top of that implant, change it into a temporary abutment. And then uh, we use the uh, acrylic resin to secure our jaw tracheal with the, the temporary abutment and make it work. And the uh, bottom left one, that's the one you uh, embedded your jaw tracker C into acrylic resin. And so it's like a snap on one and um, because um, it fit into the patient's mouth because it's a customized one. So this one, you can uh, take it on and off during the surgical procedure. And then um, the bottom right one, this is the, the I'll, I'll call it uh, a prototype of um, Joe Tracker B because um, for the fully edentulous patient back at the time, we have no idea about how to secure our trackers on the patient's Joe. Um, so this is how we uh, like so-called being creative and um, we put on acrylic resin onto the Joe Tracker C, make it into like a, a Joe Tracker B and then secure the tracker into patient's mouth with bone screw. And then the, the bottom right one, that's the, uh, the real bone tracker, uh, the real Joe Tracker B, which um, comes out later on and uh, with sc three screw holes. So it makes it uh, even more stable and also the, ma the material wise, it's more durable. So these are all the, uh, like all kinds of uh, method to secure your jaw tracker onto your patient. And I'm pretty sure all the uh, dentists are very good in securing things on your teeth. So um, everybody can have their own way in securing the jaw tracker as long as it's stable, it's not moving and uh, can be reproducible. So this, the, the picture that I'm showing right now, that's my uh, favorite way to uh, do the surgery nowadays for the edentulous patient, for like fully edentulous patient or patient with very, very few teeth. So you can appreciate it from the picture that uh, the patient has a, a obstructate which we use it as a, a mouth opener. And also it has uh, the, the retraction uh, type of uh, function. And then once you put on the optra gate, you can secure your jaw tracker uh, B onto your uh, jaw bone, and then you're good to go. So this is the, I, for myself, this is the easiest way to do the, uh, like the best control of the surgery before we start uh, doing the, the drilling part, like all the, the rest of the procedure. And then once you have your jaw tracker secure in patient's mouth, then uh, the following step will be the registration method. The registration uh, is the uh, one you have to let your nav navident to uh, synchronize the intraoral condition to your comb beam CT. So it's more like to, um, it's more like when you're using your Google map, they have to know where you are before they can start to guide you. So um, this is the, the part that we have to let the machine know where you are intraorally. There are four different ways to do the registration. The first one is tracing the trace. It's the one you use the uh, tracker sliding on your teeth and then so the uh, machine can capture all the motions and synchronize your intraoral condition to your Combium CT. And then the other three uh, from Navy bite bone screws to Navy stent, these are different from trace because um, the trace one, you don't have to uh, put on any kind of device into patient's mouth before they take the comb beam CT, since um, it's capturing the uh, tooth surface by the uh, moving motions. Once you're 
uh, tracker stay close enough on the tooth surface. That's how they recognize it. And then for the, the rest of the three, you have to put on these devices in patient's mouth before they take a comb beam CT. So that uh, the fiducials that Dr. Pro just talked about uh, will be uh, recognizable on the comb beam CT. And when you're doing the registration, the Nevident can easily uh, recognize all these fiducials and superimpose the intraoral condition to the comb beam CT. For the um, fully dentulous patient or for the patient with failing dentition, they don't have enough teeth to put on the Navi bite or the Navi stent. So we will be focusing on the trace and the bone screw, this two type of um, registration method later on. Um, starting from the bone screw, the bone screw you have to place them before you start to uh, you, before you take the the comb beam CT, and um, the bone screw insertion. There are two different ways to do it. The first one is you just do it through the gingiva, and with a screw head left exposed, just like the one you see on the uh, picture on our right hand side. Uh, the second one is you can do a small incision and then embed your uh, screw head underneath the, the gum tissue. That's the second way to do it. And for myself, I prefer to do it through gingiva because um, it's easier to recognize where your bone screws are. And also when you're uh, doing the flap procedure um, during, the, uh, during the surgery, it's easier to recognize where your bone screws are and try to avoid that because this type of bone screw, it doesn't really integrate with your bone. It's just a, a pure mechanical thing. You screw it in and then while you're doing the flap, because um, when you flap, you have to uh, use some, like you push your flap around. And if it's embedded, sometimes you could accidentally remove your uh, bone screw. If your bone screw, it's it's uh, removed, then there's no way you can replace it back at the exactly same spot. So it means you will not be able to use the screw uh, when you're doing the tracing procedure, the registration procedure. And these bone screws, they have to stay in the mouth from uh, the day you take Convim CT until the day you do the surgery. Uh, some, if like you're doing some simple cases, you can even take a comb beam CT, import it into Nevident and do the surgery on the same day. But we're talking about right now is the uh, full mouth, is the full mouth reconstructive reconstruction cases. For this type of cases, we have to take comb beam CT, we have to do diagnostic wax up virtually. Um, and then we have to superimpose the image also, later on, we have to uh, fabricate the temporaries. Uh, so it's going to take about like a, a week to finish all this procedure. It, uh, it's very hard to finish all these steps within just a few days. So always keep that in mind. You have to make sure your bone screw will be able to stay in the patient's mouth for at least a week or so, or sometimes even longer. So uh, to secure this type of bone screws, it's um, actually very, uh, it's a very difficult case uh, because in some patient, they have to wear uh, dentures and um, it could also like, or when they're eating, this could al always be um, like in the way. So some patient, they came uh, on the surgical day and uh, you will be very surprised and also very like shocked to see several of the screws there, they came loose. So it's always better to um, place a few more than what you uh, plan to place. This is the very the, the case from the very beginning. So uh, back in the day, we always placed four uh, mini implants, but for the patients who uh, might lose their implant, might lose their bone screw easier uh, because of their bone quality, um, in that type of case, I will choose to place several more um, bone screws or switch to another kind of bone screw that can stay a little bit longer. And for how many bone screws that you have to place, um, <clears throat> according to the study, at least you have to place three. <clears throat> 
excuse me, uh, for the three bone screws, uh, it's the minimal number you have to do while you're doing the registration. It's just always the concept. You have to get three points um, to connect it. Uh, if you have only two, then you will not be able to register your intraoral condition to your cone beam CT. So minimum number of um, bone screw, that's three. Preferably uh, place four or five or even more because you might lose several of them during the, the waiting period from the time you take cone beam CT to the time you do the surgery. And the more, it's not saying like you have to place 10, uh, like four or five, or six, that's actually enough. Um, for the number of teeth or the uh, bone screw that you trace, you have to get at least three to four to get the um, secure result. And the more you get, uh, it's uh, a little more accurate uh, than if you only do it on three or four. And uh, distribution, distribution wise, your bone screw have to be widely distributed from the distal to the mesial to the surgical side. If not possible, it has to stay close enough to the surgical side. And also if clinically possible, they should uh, be spread along the arch, meaning you don't place your bone screw cluster on one side. It has to be like everywhere in the, uh, in the jaw that you're going to do the surgery. All right, so this is how it, how it looks uh, on the cone beam CT after you uh, place the bone screw. And also there are fiducials on the, the temporary teeth that we use for the uh, pre-surgical workup. <laughs> and um, once you have all these bone screws, you can appreciate it from the screen. You can, uh, this, uh, this is the, the procedure before we do the tracing. You put on the landmarks on the bone screws for the site that you are going to trace. So this is how it works. And you can appreciate there's a number on the uh, plant implants. So you can see some like one or two, what does this mean? When you have enough bone screws, or enough landmarks and stay close enough to the teeth and widely distributed, just like this bone screws, some in the front, some in the back, including like mesially, distally to all the surgical side and spread along the, the ridge. And once the number shows, let's see what does the number stand for? When you see one or two show on the uh, screen, the circle is green it indicates that uh, you have a excellent registration accuracy. And when you have three or four, it goes to the yellow light, which means you're okay, but you're not like uh, as accurate uh, for the registration part as the, the green light shows. And when you have five or higher, that means um, you have to add some more bone screws so that you can um, have a better registration accuracy. For this um, zygomatic implant, you can appreciate that if you only have your bone screws in the front, they stay quite far away from your future implant site. So you will see some like five or six on the implant, which means your registration is not uh, accurate. So it's better to add some more bone screws on the uh, pallet. When it stays closer to the implant, you can appreciate that uh, the numbers start to change. As, uh, the more you have and the closer to the future implant site, the number will, will go down. So when you have it in the front and in the back, have all this uh, implants incorporate in the uh, field of your bone screws, you can see the number reduced. And as long as you have more than four, you, if you have like five or six, the number doesn't really go down more. So that's why we say you need to have at least three, four or five preferably, but you don't need to go like crazy, like six or eight or 10. It doesn't really helps a lot. 
And um, for the bone screws, there are several uh, brands that's never done compatible ones. The, uh, the one that we can use in America include the, the Selvin bone fixation screw. And you have to be a particular, there are some, like particular size that uh, will be Nevident compatible ones. They are uh, 1.5 by four by six and by eight millimeter ones. So if you go longer than this one or you go wider than uh, the expected diameters, then they, will, they won't be recognized uh, by Nevident. The second brand that's never done compatible one is the True Fix Bone Fixation Screw. And the size that's compatible ones are the 1.5 by uh, 6 by 7.5 and by 9 millimeter ones. And this is the one we used in Taiwan. And the, uh, the third one, that's the Ostomat one, um, that's the uh, compatible one and the, the one that uh, has been widely used in Europe. And the size that's compatible are 1.2 or 1.4 in diameter and 6, 8, 11, or 13 in, uh, in length. So uh, what can you see from the Navident when you use these compatible screws? It shows on the screen with the uh, type of the, the brand of the screw that you use and also the uh, diameter and the length uh, that you choose from the screen once you choose them as a registration point. So this is what you're going to see on the screen when you choose the compatible uh, screws. But uh, sometimes <clears throat> the uh, the computer doesn't recognize them as expected. So like in this case, it's the true fix 1.5 by eight millimeter screws, but you can appreciate it from the screen. The um, bone screw number one and number three are not recognized by the computer, while the uh, bone screw number two and bone screw number four are recognized. When this happened, you can um, like try several attempts to remove it and click on the different part of the screw and see if it can become recognizable. If it's still not, then um, you will use them as just a bone screw uh, as a secure point for um, doing the tracing. So like in this case, you will do tracing on bone screw number one, bone screw number three, and do the uh, point registration on your uh, bone screw number two and bone screw number four. So this is what, uh, if it happened, then this is the way you solve the problem. And also sometimes the machine could um, recognize the, the other bone screws as the, um, the one that they can recognize and accidentally uh, recognize it as, like in this case, they recognize the ortho screw as a navy bite. And um, we, we've, in this type of um, scenario, you have to choose the different point on the mini screw or the mini implant and um, make sure the, uh, make sure until the, um, so like when you click here, it shows navy bite. And then you have to try several attempts until it doesn't show as a navy bite. Because um, for the navy bite, it's a, a fiducial that the uh, computer can recognize once you touched it, they will recognize it as a, a navy bite type of fiducial. So which could create uh, the registration failure or the um, registration inaccuracy. So when this type of um, scenario happen, you have to make sure you click on the different part of the mini screw or the mini implant that you use until it disappear. So these are the two different type of scenario. The first one is when you use the compatible one and um, if it doesn't work, then it's, it's easier to solve the problem because you just do the tracing. And if it's uh, misrecognized as the compatible one, you have to choose the, the different uh, side of the implant and make sure it doesn't show as the compatible ones. So these are the, the way you, how you use the bone screws. And let's move forward to see several different, uh, in different 
kind of um, clinical scenarios and uh, how we solve the problem. And we will go through from the uh, fully edentulous patient to the patient with teeth with extensive decay. And um, sometimes we also uh, see the patient with um, failing dental implants, but uh, they also need full mouth reconstruction. Um, so this is the, the first, uh, the third kind of um, clinical scenario. So starting from the edentulous one, I'll have to say to place the bone screw that's uh, uh, for a surgeon, that's a little bit difficult because you have to um, anticipate where the, uh, where the future implants are. And um, you have to imagine how the teeth are going to be set up and try to make sure your bone screws are not uh, in the way, are not in the way of your future implant. So like in this case, uh, when you place the, the mini screws, you won't be able to know where your future teeth are until this procedure. When we do the superimposition of your uh, teeth setup to your uh, comb beam CT, this is how we do the uh, superimposition from the, uh, the denture that Dr. Ko met. Uh, she will put on several fiducials and uh, the patient will wear this denture to take a comb beam CT together with um, the bone screws in the jaw. So after we do the superimposition, not until this step will I know where the future teeth are going to be. And then uh, this is where I can start to plan my implants. So when I place the implants, uh, you have to consider where your teeth are and where do you have sufficient bone to place the implant. So like in this case, the second bone screw are actually um, in the way of uh, tooth uh, implant that we uh, plan to place at uh, tooth number 26 or tooth number 42. So when this happened, this could happen because when you place bone screws, uh, you just guess where the future implants are. And when this happened, you will be very thankful if you have placed more than four mini implants, mini, sorry, mini screws, because this one will be removed at some point uh, of the, the surgical procedure. And also uh, for uh, the case that, the, the sorry, the previous case is the one we did before the uh, Navide machine can recognize all these bone screws. So back at the time we have to do the tracing. And for uh, the nowadays, the Navidan can recognize all these bone screws. So when you click on the uh, bone screws, you can do the registration in a very easy way. This uh, the video will show. So when you click on the all the screws, they were recognized as solving uh, bone screw just as the one you, you can appreciate on the screen. And when you are doing the registration part, we call it a point pair registration. It's a lot easier than before. You just need to hold the uh, tracer on the screw at the point where you click for registration and the whole registration procedure will take about like less than a minute to finish it. Let's go back and see it one more time because it just happened too quick. When you click on it, back at the time you do tracing, it goes from one, two, three, up to a hundred and finish the tracing. And with the bone screw one, you just need to uh, put your tracer on top of the uh, mini screw then it can be recognized and uh, registered immediately. So after the registration procedure, you always do the accuracy check. This is the beauty of using the, the compatible bone screws and how easy it is. So the registration procedure will become very, very easy to execute. And in the previous version or when point pair do doesn't work, this is the way how we uh, do it. So you just use it, you just use your bone screw as a, a tooth, a stable tooth. And you will have to trace on the bone screw going from one, two, three, up to a hundred until it's done. 
and one after one. So after you're done with um, all the tracing, so you can see the difference. This one, it takes much longer compared to the, uh, before this version launched or um, <clears throat> when point pair doesn't work. So these are the ways to register uh, your intraoral condition to your Combeam CT, and then you do the accuracy check. So either way works, just um, the one it's more time saving, the other one it's more time consuming. And then um, the other type of bone screw, the reason why we use the other type of bone screw, this one it's an author, sorry, this one is an ortho screw. The reason why I use uh, ortho screw sometimes is because um, the uh, bone screw, the compatible one bone screws, sometimes they got loose uh, because um, they are, uh, the, the diameter, it's a lot smaller compared to the uh, ortho bone screw. And also in length, uh, the compatible ones are much shorter. So for some patient, uh, the bone screw come, came off quite easily. But for the ortho bone screw, they are designed for a stay in the mouth for a period of time. So we, I actually encounter less problem while using ortho bone screws uh, as the, the bone screws. And also when the, uh, when the point pair doesn't work, it's a lot more difficult to trace on the compatible bone screws because you only have a, a small screw head uh, exposed in the uh, intraorally. So you have to just go around that uh, bone screw head and do the tracing. But for the bone screw, there are uh, many parts that can be used to uh, for the, uh, the tracing part. The one, uh, there is a, a, like a hex type of um, uh, like here. So uh, I, I feel like it stays a little bit longer. And also by doing the tracing, it's easier to recognize. So for uh, some patient with very, very poor uh, bone quality condition, in this type of patient, I go with uh, the ortho bone screw. So this is the way we use it uh, for registration. And just as the one uh, you used when the bone screw cannot be recognized as the compatible ones. You use them as a, the stable landmark intraorally and then do the, the tracing procedure. This is just an, another way to work on the case. All right, and then we are moving forward to the uh, second kind of scenario when patient have teeth with extensive decay. In this type of case, if there are like extensive uh, decay on the teeth and um, the, it doesn't mean that you have to do the bone screw all the time. In this type of case, if the teeth can still hold the provision uh, in, a in a fairly stable uh, position, then in this type of case, we can register with um, the fiducials on the uh, on the temporaries, using them as a, a, a tracing uh, material. So in this type of case, sorry, I'm running out of time. In this time, uh, in this type of case, after you superimpose your temporary crowns to your uh, teeth, you can use your fiducials or your uh, landmarks on your scanning files as a registration method. So once you pick up all these points where you're going to do the uh, registration, you do the same type of um, a tracing method uh, and then um, just sliding on your teeth surface and they will be able to recognize as a, the, the temporary crowns. So they can do the synchronize between your temporary crowns and the one you can appreciate on the Combin CT. So the accurate, you also do the accuracy check after you do the tracing on the surface skin. So this is another way to do the registration to uh, use uh, by utilizing your STL files. And then in the third case, this is the last one. The last one is um, in the very severe type of case. Uh, if you happen to have like uh, one or two failing but stable implant with some uh, certain type of uh, bone landmarks, because in, in this case, you can appreciate the inferior alveolar nerve, it's in, it's in the very high position. So it's almost impossible to place 
a few more bone screws because um, it's very, you could, you could uh, touch the nerve accidentally. So in this case, I use um, these two implants and also there's a, a bone peak at uh, the patient's third quadrant. I use these three points as a, the tracing uh, landmarks. And when you are doing the correct tracing on all these landmarks, so for this patient, after the tracing on these two implants and on this bone peak, what I care the most about is um, the patient's nerve. So by touching the mental foramen after I uh, flapped it, you can appreciate that uh, we also have a very accurate uh, tracing. So from here, because um, you can, you can be very sure you're away from the nerve while you're doing the implant placement. If this is uh, the, if you have a correct tracing. So how to trace? When you're doing the tracing, this is a very difficult uh, tracing. Um, this is the, the case um, where it's very hard to do an accurate tracing. So when you're doing the tracing, you have to go like, uh, all over around in the front and in the back of the implant. So you don't do it on only one side. It's better to go back and forth. And uh, just um, you when you're doing the sliding motion, you have to make sure you stay close enough to the implant. And then um, especially in the bone part, you have to make sure you go broader, you go wide. And in the meanwhile, you stay close enough on the bone surface. And so this is how you do the tracing. You have to slide on the teeth, make sure you stay very close to the tooth surface and go back and forth. And now we have a, a new feature um, which will show uh, the trace registration on the screen. If you click on this one, show trace registration, it will tell you how accurate your traces are. So there will be several different uh, kind of uh, spheres showing on your screen. The yellow one, which is um, larger, the large uh, yellow sphere, that's the point where you click on your Combeam CT for the registration. So you start from this point and then you will see um, there are like green ones, the red ones, and the large blue balls ones. The large blue balls ones are the one where you start tracing. So you have to make sure the point you start tracing that stays close enough to the yellow ones. Though it's better that you can superimpose your blue ones to your yellow ones. At least they have to stay close enough. And then the green ones and the red ones means um, if you stay close enough to the two surface, it shows the green one. And uh, for the red ones, it means um, you don't stay close enough to your tooth surface. If you are like uh, a millimeter or more away from your tooth surface, it shows the red one. So um, this one helps you to do the, the registration. Um, if you are not familiar with the machine or you're just a beginner in using Evident, you can turn on this one and see how accurate your tracings are. If you're doing this one correctly, when you do the accuracy check, you will get a, a very good result, a favorable outcome. All right, so I'll hand over to Celine to finish the last piece of our presentation. Lock off first. Okay, so uh, we're running out of time, so. Uh, for the final part that we are going to talk about, the latest feature would be the abutment plan. And this is actually very crucial for prosthodontists like me because um, you basically, you need to have the implant inserted in, but you eventually need to restore a crown. So for if it's, a, if it's called a nice day, what a wonderful day, that would be the bone is perfect, and the implant can insert in properly just like this animation. And then you restore a crown accordingly. And the crown can fulfill all the parameters we just talked about, a premium quality of the prosthesis. However, things will never go as what you expected, especially in the failing dentition or fully dentalism. 
The bone geometry frequently resorbs atrophy severely up to the point that your implant, no matter how much you can graft it, you still need to place an implant within the bony confine. And that being said is basically your implant has no choice but need to tilt at a certain angle to fulfill this bony confine requirement. So if we need to restore a crown property, then we definitely need something that correct this disparity in between the implant angulation along with the crown so that we can still achieve all this premium quality parameters. And that is especially crucial for full mouth rehab implant prosthesis because we want to provide the prosthetic part that's all be splinted together so we can minimize the implant numbers while maximizing all the strength of the definitive prosthesis. That being said, if we need to have everything um, splinted together, achieving the passive fit, the passive insertion, meaning that we have to have the implant angulation to be corrected into the certain angle that needs to be parallel. So both are the disparity as I just described, we need this particular uh, parts, implant parts to correct this disparity. And that is what so-called transmucosal abutment, also known AKA uh, the multi-unit abutment. So the previous version that we basically plan on how to select the proper uh, multi-unit abutment, transmucosal abutment is we basically have the teeth that's been designed, which is where you can see the uh, pinkish outer border of the tooth. And we plan the implant according to the outer border of the tooth through the center. So you can see in the middle of the screen, we have the implant pl planned in first at the center of the tooth both mesially, distally, and buccolingually. Then we calculated the angle and the distance starting from the platform of the feet, uh, sorry, starting from the platform of the fixture till the, uh, till wherever you want the implant screw axis to be come out. That being said, for interior teeth, you definitely don't want the, the screw axis to come out through the buccal side or incisal edge. You want to come out through the cingulum. So you need this multi-unit abutment, transmucosal abutment to correct according to what you measure the degree, which is 17 degree. And that gives the like full, like I will give full credit for this new um, invention of the software, which is having you being visualized how the abutments are going to be adding on. And that helps you to have an idea whether all these implants are parallel and whether the angulation and the height is being brought up and corrected correctly. So nowadays, how the way that we planned it is also we measure the distance and the angulation that we want to correct it but we will utilize the new feature, the latest feature of the abutments that are being added on. And you can see what this, um, the column, the section, the category that it's been popped up. You have different features of the abutment that you can be able to enter the then you manipulated it. So that has, that could be fulfilled what the implant manufacturer that you are using, sorry, the implant brand that you're using to, uh, you basically, you just need to enter in all the parameters so that can corresponding to what the implant brand that you're using. So you can see the top part, you have the generic, so you measured it and then, um, the, if you what if the implant brand that happened that you use is one of the built in implants that um, we actually have over here that it includes Strawman, that includes Nobel Belt here, that includes um, Ankylos. So if you're having those implant brand, you can just select it from the generic part and substitute that into the implant brand that you're using. But if you don't, then just like me, you know, you can select the angulation that you are going to change in the future by correcting the first column that I circled it out. I want it to be 17 to 20 degree. And the degree of the correction that literally has to follow what the implant brand that you're using, what the manufacturer of the implant that they have fabricated out this standard type of multi-unit. So for instance, the implant that I'm using right now, that's uh, Strawman. So Strawman basically has the multi-unit abutment that angulation can correct it to 20 degree to 30 degree. 
that's only two types. If it's for Nobel, then they have 70 degree or 30 degree. So it's either all these two or three numbers that you can choose from, and that's totally basically solitary by your the company of the implant that you're using, the brand. So you have to select angulation first, and then the height of the implant abutment that corresponding to what implant abutment parts that you're using, along with the color height, the soft tissue height that you have to measure properly to lift the implant abutment fixture junction away from the crystal bone so that avoid the future potential crystal bone loss. And the final check is always the axis. As we said, you want to have like a full mouth rehab prosthesis, the splinted implant supported fixed dental prosthesis that's being able to uh, passive fitting on all these implants and then having this passive insertion that's clear. So you definitely need to double check upon each of the implant angulation as well as the whole picture to make sure that they are all somewhat parallel or within the confine that the multi-unit of a bobbin that you're using can be able to correct it. So the last, the very, very last take home message would be the strategy of navigation machine. Basically it consists with the plan, which is the 30 minutes that I've been spending on to telling you guys that you have to define where future teeth are going to be by digitally design the teeth position. Then you superimpose your teeth position along with bone. So you plan the implant accordingly, whether you need grafting or you need to place the implant all together, that consists the plan part. And that basically is what we typically explain to the, um, all the audience. You know, you basically need to tell the machine where you are going to go in the future. The mm -hmm. second part would be what Dr. Chu just mentioned about. You have to tell the machine where you are. So you basically need to register your position along with what you have planned. So both of the position can synchronize together and that allows you to do the third part, which is the place part. So that uh, being said, um, thank you very much for your attending today. And these are all the warriors that from our country that they have been won winning the medals through the Olympic games. So I hope you enjoy the games as well as our presentation today. Thank you very much. And we're now open to question and answer. Beth, you want to introduce the following course? Sure. Um, our next program that we have coming up is actually a live program that's going to take place in Toronto on Saturday, September 25th. And this will be focused on Navident and endodontic applications. Um, it's a full day hands-on workshop. If you have any questions, you can contact me or register um, online with Kamisha. And for those of you that have attended this course, if you decide to go to the one in Toronto, we are waiving the tuition. Just mention the fact that you um, attended this webinar and the $99 will be waived. So thank you so much. Doctors, that was a fabulous presentation. I really um, appreciated it, learned a lot. And I think our attendees did as well, I'm sure. Um, for those of you that are looking for your CE documents, you can find them on this link. And um, again, we do have some time for Q and A's. If anybody has any questions, please type them in the chat box. Otherwise, we wish you all a great day or a great evening. Any questions? You must have been both very thorough. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they are just being shy. So. That could be. Yeah. Yeah, they, you guys can email. That's a lot of, you know, as I said, 30 minutes or an hour for Filma 3 have a special digitalizing Filma 3 have. It's actually heavy. And especially mm -hmm. we're focusing on a lot of new features that's assisting exactly. us. Yeah, on planning. So uh, we are open to any questions in terms of email. So if you guys are, you know, you guys want to discuss anything further, you're too shy to discuss about it at the, you know, at the platform, you will always welcome to email us. 
So, and you all will yeah. be um, getting a recorded version of this presentation. Mm -hmm. so again, mm -hmm. watch it. If yeah. you have any questions, the doctors have graciously offered to um, take them via email. So mm -hmm. we thank you very much. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, you. doctors. Thank you. Thank you. Great program. Thank you, Beth. Thank have you. A have a good evening. You too. Yeah. Bye. Bye.